Good morning and welcome to the Rural Economy and Co Connectivity Committee's 31st meeting in 2018. Could I ask everyone please to make sure that their mobile phones are on silence? Apologies have been received from Mike Rumbles and Jamie Green, and I'd like to welcome Jamie Green's substitute, John Scott, to the meeting. The first item on the agenda is a decision on taking business in private. The committee has asked to consider taking item seven and any future review of the evidence that we have heard at that session on the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill in private. Are members agreed? Yes. That's agreed then. We're now going to move on to the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. This is our first evidence session on the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill, and the committee will now take evidence from the Scottish Government Bill Team. I'd like to welcome from the Scottish Government, Karen Jackson, the South of Scotland Economic Development Team Team Leader, Sandra Reid, uh, the Bill Team Leader, Felicity Cullen, the Scottish Government Le from the Scottish Government Legal Directorate, and Fraser Goff, the Parliamentary Council to the Scottish Government. We have a series of questions uh, for you this morning, and I'm sure you're well versed in how this works, so the, the microphones will light up for you, and if you catch my eye, I will try and uh, bring you in at the relevant time. The, of course, there's a danger on this committee, if you look the other way when a question's raised, I, I'll just have to... Uh, point at the person who doesn't look away fast enough. So the first question this morning will be from John Finney. John. Thank you, Gunina. Uh, good morning, panel. Uh, I wonder if you would out able to outline for the committee the extent of the government consultation on this, particularly uh, with regard to businesses, communities, individuals, councils, trade unions, third sector organisation, and what the key messages, messages raised during the consultation process were. Particularly interested if the, the question of the social development element of the was picked up, because of course that's what would differentiate it from the existing arrangements. Please. Um, question. Karen, don't need yeah. to press a button though. It just comes you don't need to press Perfect. a button. It lights up for you. In fact, it's already lit, so you're on air. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that question. I think it's fair to say that engagement has been a really key part of our work throughout um, the uh, developing the proposals. Um, both formal and informal. The Scottish Government's pre-legislative Britain consultation ran for three weeks in March, um, between March and June, and we received a really good response. We got 268 respondents to that, um, uh, to that written consultation. Um, it was a really good mixture, so we got 115 responses from organisations and the rest from individuals, so again, a really good spread, both of people really interested in that organisational um, coverage as well. We complemented that written consultation by uh, events across the south of Scotland. So we ran 26 events across the same period. Um, and the National Economic Forum took place um, in Dumfries in, um, at the end of May as well. So um, again, that brought in businesses. Um, that consultation built on um, previous consultations that we had during the Enterprise and Skills Review. So again, a, a, that co engagement with stakeholders has been a really important bit of our work. Um, you asked a little bit about the themes that were coming out. Yes, of the, the key messages, please, and, and, and particularly whether social development was, was picked up on. Yeah. Please. Um, so we've obviously published the um, summary of responses, so I, w I won't go through it in too much detail. But essentially, people were really focused on ensuring the South is an attractive place to visit, to live and to work, looking at how we created better employment opportunities and better paid jobs. Um, recognising that the south of Scotland had a very different economy, so the business base was different, and the new agency needed to respond to the needs and opportunities there. And there was a real focus around young people. Clearly, um, the, population, the south of Scotland is facing young people moving out, so a real, um, lots of comments about what we needed to do to help young people create new opportunities there. And then picking up on the communities piece, there was a, a real um, theme coming through around recognising the strength of communities in the south of Scotland. Um, they're resilient, they're strong, and the new agency can do something to help that. And then we've picked that up in the social element of the remit of the agency. So absolutely a, a, a key point there. The other themes were around the sectors that were important in the south of Scotland. So recognising that um, the economy is different. There are certain sectors there, like forestry, tourism, creative industries, not an exhaustive list. Um, but... Um, that the agency can pick up on. And then, as you can imagine, there are issues around connectivity, both physical and digital. 
Okay, uh, can I push again on, on the issue of social development? Because the, 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 the situation in the Highlands, and, and I represent uh, the Highlands and Islands, as does the convener, is that um, historically that was seen as a hugely important part of the HIDB and NHIE's work. And that's, that, that emphasis seems to have changed. Now, with a new organisation, it's not just about the economics, it is about the social. Can, can, you, can you say the extent to which that will feature in the work, please? Um, Yes, so uh, if you look at the um, overarching aims of the new agency, that absolutely picks up on the fact that the new agency will promote, this, as well as the economic development of the um, South, the social development of the South. So absolutely, we see that as integrated. We're looking at places, businesses and communities are equally important in place, and the new agency will bring that together. OK, thank you very much. And, 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 and looking ahead, the anticipated timetable, should the legislation proceed, um, it, when would the chair and board be appointed? When will an action plan be published? And where will the headquarters be? These sort of issues. <laughs> Gosh, there's a lot in that question. Um, or when will it be decided then, rather than? So, as he, as he um, started out, assuming Parliament approves the legislation, in terms of the um, timetable for the chair, we hope to start that process as soon as Parliament's approved the principle of the bill. So when we um, reach the end of stage one. That should then let the public appointments process run um, so that ideally we'd have a chair in place towards the end of the summer. Um, you asked about decisions around location. A plan? Um, the plan will be for the new agency um, itself to um, publish. So um, we'd expect that to happen after the new agency came into force. Again, if Parliament approves the legislation, we're expecting the new agency to be established on the 1st of April 2020. So the action plan developed and approved after that. Um, and around location, um, the consult consultation was really clear that people wanted to see the agency everywhere, accessible to all. They thought that one single headquarters was really the wrong way to do go. So we're looking at how we ensure that um, we deliver that in practice, so that co-location point around public agencies. So again, we've not set a timetable for that, but that work is progressing at the moment. Okay, and, and where to proceed, the, the, the time frame within which the board would be appointed, you, you, you'll have the chair first, presumably? I'll have the chair first, and then we'd assume that the chair would have a role in the appointments process after that. So ideally, we'd have the members in place before the 1st of April 2020, ready to start when the agency is established. Okay, many thanks be quite a tight uh, time scale to get everyone in and a location or locations for the next question then is from John Scott John uh, thank you uh, convener uh, good morning um, so just continuing in that theme uh, why is primary legislation required and what are the benefits of this approach compared to other available options now this is the dangerous part where you all look away um, Sandra, you, you, do you want to lead off on that? I'll take it if that's okay. okay Karen. Sorry, I was just looking for my, um, for my bit of paper which tells me all about um, legislation. Um, so again, um, the um, bill's implementing decisions that came from the Enterprise and Skills Review. Um, through that review, we looked at various different options for a structure of a body, um, not just legislation, but also lots of other um, options. So we looked at whether it should be a partnership, which didn't, wouldn't require pr primary legislation, but would be supported by a memorandum of, of understanding. We looked towards the local government legislation, whether it should be a joint committee under that legislation. We looked at whether it should be a co company un owned by the public sector, or whether one of the existing public agencies in the south of Scotland could deliver it under a, a separate kind of um, branch. But the conclusion was absolutely the new public body was the right way to go. Um, a real consensus developed during the Enterprise and Skills Review that primary legislation was right. We assessed all those different options against different principles, and the um, agency and legislation scored best against them all. Um, I think we decided that was the most ambitious way to go. It would deliver the transformational change that everybody wanted to see. It would be independent and would be able to employ its own staff. There'd be a clarity around its budget and it could pick up and support both businesses and communities with that wider remit. Um, the legislation would define a really clear remit and, and people would be able to engage with it. It also had the benefit of being able to be part of the national structure um, of other enterprise agencies. So we thought for all those reasons, the legislation was the right way to go. Thank you. Oh, that's very clear. Um, 
What historic, social, economic and cultural reasons are there for treating Scottish borders and Dumfries and Galloway differently to other areas south of the central belt? For example, parts of South Lanarkshire and Ayrshire, and I declare an interest as a resident of uh, South Ayrshire. Um, and, for example, won't parts of uh, South Ayrshire, south of Girvan, for example, which is a natural fit into this whole area and was disadvantaged before under the, um, the what was it, the leader scheme, not the leader schemes, but the, the ones in the 1990s when, when Stu and Stevenson at that time actually tried to get the area south of Girvan included into that part of the south of Scotland um, for, for special treatment. What, what, so if you want to give me the reasons why you chose the areas, but why you decided to disadvantage other areas, perhaps, although it's not my constituents. So it looks like it's you as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy to take that, that question. Um, again, the boundary issue has one we've been exploring for quite a long time. Um, as part of the Enterprise and Skills Review, we looked at how you might define the south of Scotland, um, and there were various options we had there. We looked at whether it should mirror the south of Scotland parliamentary region, which brought in um, a range of different local authorities, or whether it should pick up on the southern Scotland nuts to area, which I'm happy to write and define what that is, but um, it, was, it brought in a lot of different... Um, uh, different local authorities, um, and then the focus on the two council areas. Um, the consensus during that period emerged that the two local authorities, the Scottish Borders and Dumfries and Galloway Council, were the right way to go. Um, that reflected the economic challenges faced by those two areas um, and the opportunities they had, so it could offer a real focus on tackling those challenges. It, we also um, emerged that actually it was much clearer for businesses and for communities if they knew exactly um, which agency to go to, and the other definitions were a bit more, would have been much more confusing for the um, service user. It also recognised that the work in the local area, um, there were um, the South of Scotland Alliance um, was already a partnership of those two local authorities, so it was building on that local stakeholder engagement. Similarly, um, those two local authorities have come together in the Borderlands Growth Deal, um, again, to... Um, to to build that partnership. So we thought that the focus on those two areas built on that work that was going on locally. Absolutely, Ayrshire and other bits of um, uh, Scotland have been interested, but during the consultation, they, they supported the, um, the boundary that we were developing. So both Ayrshire and South Lanarkshire was the other area. Um, look to other um, structures. So the Ayrshire's obviously have their... Um, a growth deal structure that they're looking at in South Lanarkshire as part of Glasgow um, city region deal area. But we're not creating an island, so I think absolutely um, the legislation is very clear that the new agency can work across its boundaries looking at other local authority areas and also in, in England so that it benefits um, the people of the south of Scotland and you get that alignment of purpose. So the boundary notwithstanding it's the two local authority areas are 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 loosely defined then, is that what you're saying? No, the, it, so, it's, it, so the definition of the boundary is the two local authority areas, so Scottish Borders Council and Dumfries and Galloway Council are the two local authority areas of the geography. The agency will be able to align and cooperate with um, organisations outside that boundary to benefit um, the people of the south of Scotland. Okay, you want to come in? Um, I'm familiar with these boundary issues because my uh, constituency straddles Highlands and Islands and Scottish Enterprise. In other words, I'm partly in Murray and partly in Aberdeenshire. Um, and I just wondered if uh, Scottish Enterprise, who of course will retain uh, responsibility for South Ayrshire and other adjacent local authorities, will they be taking particular actions to collaborate with the new body for the South of Scotland to ensure that the neighbouring areas are not disadvantaged in a way that they might, they, they might be areas of difficulty today, but that those difficulties don't come, become greater because that would appear to be necessary to do at the boundary areas that yeah um in relation to, to scottish enterprise um as, as karen said the the new agency um its remit is within the, the the south of scotland area but we expect it to collaborate with other agencies including scottish enterprise um as it does that the the new agency um 
will focus on regional economic activity within the south of Scotland, um, but collaborate Scottish Enterprise, I expect, will, will remain a national agency, but they will both work together um, to, to, the, to ensure that, that we, we achieve the aims. Do, do forgive me, I think that's what I would have expected you to say, but I want to draw you just closer to the very specifics that will Scottish Enterprise take any particular action to support areas which are adjacent to the new uh, area, because at the boundary, differential policies can, of course, you know, within just a few hundred metres, create difficulties which come from administrative decisions and I just wondered if uh, if, if, if that uh, you know North and East Ayrshire and uh, South Ayrshire and you know other border uh, other bordering authorities particularly are others is there going to be a particular focus on making sure that that doesn't happen because we have disadvantaged areas north of the new proposed area pick that up, yeah. Um, so Scottish Enterprise have been engaged in um, the work we're doing around regional econo economic partnerships. I know you're hearing from Scottish Enterprise, I think, in a two or three weeks' time, so they'll be able to give you more detail on their work around what they're doing to align in other regional areas. Um, but they're absolutely, with their new chief executive, they're looking at their regional approach and how they tailor their, their responses to other, um, other parts of Scotland. Which neatly leads on to the next question from Maureen. Maureen. Mina, thank you. So what do you think Scottish Enterprise is currently unable to do uh, in the borders area or in this new south of Scotland um, uh, that the new agency will be able to do? Who wants to head off on that? Sandra. I'll start with that one. Um, well, the, well, the new agency will, um, will, will have the, the ability and the, the flexibility to be able to respond to the needs of the south of Scotland, more specifically to focus its resources on um, looking at the circumstances of the area and what's needed to help, help achieve its aims of um, supporting businesses, um, sustaining communities and um, harnessing the potential of, of, of the people in the area. And I think that that will be it will be the ability for the new agency to, to to put a renewed focus into the south of Scotland. One of the things that's being talked about a lot um, recently is kind of the borders area, cross border. How will and and that you know that I think there's not a kind of equivalent of a city deal, is there not in terms of the borders area? Um, Maybe you could explain a bit about that and where it's at and whether this new agency will be able to access funds from it and perhaps use them in better than they might otherwise be. Karen, do you want to start and maybe Sandra come in or the other way round? Which, which I'll one? start and then the, okay. Sandra can pick up on the different Karen, detail. Karen, off you go. Um, so the board, it's, um, you're right, we're looking at the Borderlands Growth Deal. Um, the Borderlands area takes in um, Dumfries and Galloway Council um, and Borders Council, and then three English local authorities, so that's Carlisle, Cumbria, and um, Northumberland. Um, and they're coming together to put proposals to, government, to both governments um, about a growth deal. Um, in terms of where we are at the moment, they've submitted the proposals to both governments, um, and we're looking at the detail of what's in those propositions. I think there are 10 different um, outline business cases which uh, focus on various themes that they see as key to driving growth across that area. Um, as the detail develops, we'll be looking at how those different propositions and proposals are delivered. So the new agency will absolutely have a role in delivering some of those projects. So a focus perhaps on um, energy or on... Um, tourism or on place, you can see the agency getting involved in that delivery and we're really um, working hard to ensure that both um, the projects in Borderlands and what the agency's priorities are are really closely aligned. Um, you'd expect a new agency to be absolutely integrated with what a Borderlands proposition wanted to do. Sandra, so, you... sorry, so, I, I wasn't sure sorry, whether Sandra yeah. wanted to come in. Uh, sorry, Nothing Maureen, sorry. So south of the border, um, are the three council areas working separately or do they come together in some sort of agency or grouping at all? Or Together in the Borderlands Partnership, right. so um, the, so the um, proposals that have been submitted to both governments are from the Borderlands Partnership, so from all five local authorities together. 
Thank you. Uh, Colin, I think yours is the next question. The panel. The, the board membership um, will be appointed by ministers as will the chair and the first um, chief executive. The location of the new agency will be a decision um, by ministers as well. And, and I see that the action plan um, can only be changed by the, the new agency with permission of ministers. And that, that obviously raises some concerns over the issue of, of local accountability. So specifically on the, the board membership, how, how will we ensure that the decisions on membership are in line with um, local opinion? Uh, Sandra. Yeah, well, South Scotland Enterprise, as you'll be aware, is going to be an NDPB, so the appointments will be made via an open and fair um, appointments process regulated by the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life and also the Code of Practice for Ministerial Appointments to Public Bodies in Scotland. As stated in the, in the policy memorandum, which you may have, have looked at, our aim is that members will provide a balanced mix of the relevant skills and experience necessary um, which reflect businesses and communities in the south of Scotland. And we um, intend to ensure that the ad appointments um, will be advertised in a way which will attract a strong and diverse field of suitable candidates, um, and particularly focusing on those in the south of Scotland. And that, that, that practice is a standard for the existing enterprise agencies, Scottish Enterprise and High, whose members are also appointed through a public appointments process. What we also intend to do as part of that process is a clear um, description of the, the skills and knowledge and expertise um, required will be, be put together um, f uh, and, and used as part of that appointment process. And in, in drawing that together, will also uh, reflect on the responses to the consultation. The consultation asked about um, board members um, and, and res respondees um, submitted their views um, on what they would like to see, and that included things like, as you, as you say, people from the local area, um, could be young people, individuals from the private sector, but again, they reinforced the need for it to, to be representative of the people in the south of Scotland, and we'll be working hard to ensure that is, is, is what the board is made up of. So, so, so the bill itself doesn't, doesn't specify those, that list of expertise as such, so you'll specify that, will that ensure that you have a mix, you, you, you have young people represented, we have trade unions uh, represented, we have small business owners represented, and specifically can I ask, in terms of the current economic partnership, the local authority are represented on that, the interim board, why are the local authority not represented on the new agency? Well, um, yeah, these will all be factors that we take into account. Um, through the public appointments process, but as you say, the bill doesn't doesn't specify any of the, the detail of of that. Um, obviously, um, local authorities, councillors, or, or members could apply um, to be uh, members on the board. Um, and for example, I'm aware that Councillor Stephen Hagen is a member of the board on Visit Scotland. So, so there, there's there's access through um, through that means. Ultimately, the final decision on membership will be made by by ministers. Yes, that's how the bill um, defines it. At the and, and on the issue of ministerial um, direction, I notice in the, the Highlands and Islands legislation that ministers can only issue direction following consultation with Highlands and Islands Enterprise, but the South of Scotland bill uh, doesn't make such a requirement. Um, so, can I ask why that is the case, and are ministers able effectively to veto decisions of, of, of the agency in the South of Scotland? The, the bill doesn't specify that you're correct, but I would expect these, these powers of direction probably to be used only in exceptional circumstances um, and, and in consultation or engagement with the new agency. I'm just, I'm just intrigued as to why that's specified in the Highlands and Islands legislation, but it's not specified in this, that this consultation should, should take place. Uh, well, that's... It's, um I think that's something that, that, that could be considered if you considered that was a, 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 a something that should be contained within the bill. Just to clarify that, I mean, it, it, it's not a conscious omission. Um, there's, there's, there's nothing there. It's just something that hasn't transferred across, but it, it's something that you think may be considered at a later date. Is that right? That, that's correct. There's no, no particular decision. And as I say, it would expect some consultation um, or engagement um, before any direction was, was to be issued. Colin, do you have any further questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, the next questions are from Richard. Rich Love. Yeah, good morning. Um, when you create a new organisation, 
You surely specify who's doing what, who will be responsible, who will be involved in order for a new any new organisation to work. So, and the two questions I'm going to ask you, given the importance of the strategic board to the government's enterprise and skills reform uh, agenda, why is there no mention of it in either in the bill or in the policy memorandum? Who'd like to go on that? Uh, Karen, you're, you are sort of havering. I'm looking forward to answering the question. Um, so the strategic board isn't defined in legislation, so um, it's, a, it's a different kind of construct, so that's why it's not on the face of the bill. We'd absolutely expect, like the chairs and chief executives of other agencies, for the chair of this new agency to be part of that strategic board um, process. See, the fact that, is that you create an agency and sometimes everybody's doing the same thing, and that's where I come on to my next question. So the bill specifies a role for the new South of Scotland agency, enhancing skills and capabilities relevant to employment. This is surely a core function of Skills Development Scotland. So how will the two agencies work? Is this not surely duplication, going to cause confusion, and right from the very start is, is going to be a disaster? So how are we going to sort that? Hold on. Um, sorry, I think we're all taken back that, 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 that somebody's just said this may be a disaster. Karen, you're going to convince us it's not going to be an answer to Richard's question. Um, so we're here to probe. <laughs> <laughs> we will avoid disasters. Um, so, that there will, so the agency it won't be the only agency operating in the south of Scotland after the 1st of April 2020. You're absolutely right. There are other agencies already operating there, Skills Development Scotland being one, Visit Scotland being another, local authorities being there. Scottish Enterprise will still have a uh, presence. Now, we'd argue that that is absolutely right because the south of Scotland will benefit from the input of lots of different agencies. What will how do we stop duplication and how do we ensure it's complementary rather than duplicatory, which I think is our aim. Um, and that's about the new agency acting as a voice of the South of Scotland. So having that dialogue with Skills Development Scotland, for example, and identifying in the South, there are sectors such as forestry, which need different skills. So having that informed discussion with SDS about how they can then respond to the needs of the South of Scotland. So I think it strengthens the position for people in the South rather than um, creating a kind of confusion. Yeah, well, just in case people uh, take my other comment out of context, I don't want it. I want it to be uh, something which is well overdue for the south of Scotland, something that is well needed, and I want to ensure that the organisation will work with other people to ensure that it is a good uh, level footing for the future. Thank you. Started with the strategic board, so that alignment happens from kind of national down, absolutely. Right. Thanks. OK, and Colin, you've got a supplementary to that. On that point, the hands and hands legislation um, is clear they've got responsibility for many functions that are carried out by Scottish Enterprise elsewhere. But the, the South of Scotland Bill it states that property and liabilities of Scottish Enterprise will be transferred to the new uh, South of Scotland uh, agency. But it doesn't clarify which, if any, functions that, that, that Scottish Enterprise will retain. So it's not entirely clear um, who, what functions Scottish Enterprise will retain and what specific functions the new agency will, will, will have. Do you think that needs clarified as, as the bill goes forward, or is, is that something you'll, you, you'll set out? Um, well, the, well, the bill has been drafted in a way that is high level and enabling to provide the flexibility for the new agency to determine what activities would be most appropriate to meet the needs and circumstances of the south of Scotland. As, as kind of we said, we, we expect the, the new body to assume responsibility for regionally specific enterprise activity. And, the, and kind of through that, as you say, it may be um, building on, on work that's already been done and we expect Scottish Enterprise to remain the national agency. Um, it will continue to have a presence in the South, we're sure, with, with national products um, such as, as SMAS or, or RSA and that will be something that will be getting developed, um, the, the activities for, for the new body through our um, project delivery um, as we work towards the establishment of the new agency to determine what activities um, the new body um, may take forward. So, uh, I think you're right that the bill is very high level and, and, and uh, the aims are, are clearly 
quite general in the bill, I think it's probably the fair, fair thing to, to say. Whereas, again, in the Highlands Islands it, legislation, it's very specific. Um, and the list of functions are a lot more detailed when it comes to Highlands and Islands. Um, what's, why, why, why is it different in terms of this legislation? And one, one argument I have heard is that um, Highlands and Islands enterprise, because it's too specific in that legislation, have been prevented from doing things because their, their, their aims or their functions in the bill uh, is, is very detailed and very specific. So do we have any examples of something that Highlands and Islands Enterprise have tried to do they've not been able to do because of the way their legislation is written? The aims, and then maybe Fraser will come in on the drafting construct. Um, so the, the aim of the bill is high level. It's to um, further the economic and social development of the south of Scotland and improve the amenity and environment of the south of Scotland. It then gives illustrations of, what that might, of how that might be achieved. Um, I think it would be fair to say that that's, um, reflects modern drafting um, uh, practice. So we, we believe with that high aim, with those illustrations, the new agency can do what it needs to do to respond to the opportunities and needs in the South. Fraser, do you want to just say a little bit about um, the way the Act is constructed, the Bill is constructed? Yeah, the, um, the 1990 Act is, as Karen suggests, very much a product of its time uh, and the way it's drafted and structured. I can't speak to exactly what problems SE or High may have encountered in terms of the restrictions. These days, we would tend to avoid the long exhaustive lists of things which are in each case in the 1990 Act given as specific examples of things under the generality of the power to do anything in pursuance of those bodies' aims. Um, the, the difficulty with having very elaborate lists is that they begin to look as though they are constraining. And the more words you have on the legislative page, the more opportunity you give lawyers to create arguments that if you, you can infer constraints that otherwise weren't intended. Um, so we tend to eschew that, that style of drafting um, these days. I mean, if I can give you just a simple example, one of the things that Scottish Enterprise and Highlands Islands are empowered to do is reclaim land from the sea. Now, what we say is that South of Scotland Enterprise can acquire land and enter into contracts, i.e. contracts with people who would be involved in reclaiming land from the sea. So we're dealing with it, the same propositions, but at a higher level of abstraction. We don't need to get down to the specifics in the same way. So, so for example, the, the, the Highlands Islands legislation specifically mentions compulsory purchase. So are you saying that the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency will have that power of compulsory purchase as well? well it'd be fair to say another reason for some of quite a lot of the complexity actually in the 1990 Act surrounds powers that as a matter of policy the government isn't proposing to give to South of Scotland Enterprise. That includes the compulsory purchase powers. It includes the powers to enter onto land without permission. It includes the powers to enter uh, to require people to give information under penalty of criminal sanction for not providing it. Um, it. These are as a matter of policy not being pursued for the South of Scotland. So, can I just prove that further then? I mean, the, the Highlands Islands legislation does talk in depth about safeguarding environment, natural beauty, geography of the region, uh, including those provisions on developing the environment and derelict land, whereas um, the South of Scotland bill only refers to the amenity environment of the region uh, and doesn't really mention natural assets. So are you saying that the bill, the South of Scotland Enterprise, are, their responsibilities in this regard are weaker than those for the Highlands Islands. So, so can you give an absolute guarantee to the committee that there is no power that's been given to the Highlands and Islands Agency that is not being given to the South of Scotland Agency? Your question began from the premise that by having less detail, the, other, the existing agencies were more constrained. Um, I think we're quite comfortable that if anything, by having less detail and less constraint built in than the 1990 Act has, there's nothing, well, subject to the policy exceptions that I've mentioned around compulsory purchase, obtaining information and so forth. But in the broad pursuance of its aims, the aims are every bit as broad, if not broader. Additional, just to be clear, there's no additional powers because you're talking about compulsory purchase, etc. There does appear to be additional powers given to Highlands and Islands that are not being given to the South of Scotland Agency. Is that, is that the case? 
Yes, there are those, those specific ones I've mentioned, the compulsory purchase, the power to obtain information from people, uh, and the power to enter onto land without permission. Colin, I, I think those are important points which you'll get a chance to ask HIE when they, when they come in to see how relevant they are and those powers and whether they've used them. I don't, I don't want to cut you off because I want to bring in John and then I'm very happy to come back to you if, if you want to develop that further. John. Uh, thank you, Kavina. I'm going to be like an old record and I'm going to ask about social development again because I, I, I think this was, is, in layperson's terms, this is what marked out HIE as different from Scottish Enterprise and I would want to understand that the somewhat perhaps romantic notion people had about the role of the old Highlands and Islands Development Board and then its successor organisation, namely that it wouldn't just be involved as it appears to be now in a lot of the high level strategy stuff about increasing businesses with their, within their portfolio with export, that they are, there is meaningful engagement with communities at very, uh, at very local level. Is that going to be a feature of the... Uh, um, or could you give me examples of social development that you em envisage that Sco South of Scotland would do? Because my concern is that it drops off and it's simply begun, uh, rather than communities, it's it just solely concerned with the balance sheets of large companies. So I'll, I'll start that. Um, so absolutely, the bill gives the um, agency that social de development responsibility. Um, the consultation gave a range of examples of the sorts of activities you might expect it to be taking forward as part of that community um, element. So absolutely, that focus on developing community capacity. Looking. Sorry to interrupt, Cam. Just for the record, could you s detail some of these these um, activities that? Absolutely. Would yeah. Um, so uh, we explored um, helping communities acquire specific assets, looking at how they could use those assets to generate income. Uh, uh, that's a level of detail I'm not going to be able to answer properly, um, so uh, okay, we can come back to that in writing. But, um, so that community empowerment stuff, um, helping community develop um, specific assets, generating income and delivering services. Social enterprises we recognise are really important in the south of Scotland, so the new agency will absolutely have that focus on what it can do to help grow social enterprises. Um, Community-based businesses similarly are really important in resilient communities and play an important part in the economy of the South. So again, you'd expect the agency to be um, looking at those sorts of businesses. Um, that place-based focus, so absolutely having an agency focused on the South of Scotland, they'll be able to really understand what makes the place um, tick. So both the business um, element of that, but also the community thing, uh, community element. So what is the important thing in a place that makes it vibrant and resilient? That's not necessarily a business. It could be a community facility. Absolutely, the agency will be focused on there. Um, and then how the agency can help communities respond to um, opportunities that are presented to them. Um, Highlands and Islands Enterprise are working closely with us, so we understand the best practice there. But we're, we're working with other agencies like um, DTAS, like the Southern Uplands Partnership, to bring in different um, perspectives. Uh, in terms of the consultation, we got lots of responses from com community councils and community organisations. So there's a wealth of information there about the actual practical things that the agency could be helping to tackle. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Um, Richard, do you want to come in? Uh, wait, you know, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. sorry, who wants to come in? Fraser, I missed you, sorry. sorry I, I just wanted to add on the point about the, the absence of compulsory purchase and helping communities acquire assets. Of course, one of the things to bear in mind is that since the 1990 Act, this Parliament's conferred community rights to buy. Um, there are more compulsory purchase powers than the Town and Country Planning Act 97, which again didn't exist in 1990. So again, when you're comparing these two acts and what's missing, we have to bear in mind that the legislative landscape has moved on in large measure through this Parliament's efforts. Okay, Richard. Yeah, just to make sure, uh, following on Colin Smith and John Finney's questions, will this agency have the same powers or more as other agencies? Yes or no? Who'd like to uh, dodge that question? There's lots of you wanting to dodge it. Can do you think? I mean, I'm, I, I think. It, do you want to try that one? Um, so the, high, the um, overarching aim of the agency is absolutely what you'd expect Highlands and Islands Enterprise to do. So absolutely on that, it's equivalent. As Fraser's been explaining, there are elements of detail which are different to reflect the different um, legislative pro processes and acts that have been made since. Pressure. So basically what you're saying is this agency will not have the same powers 
as Hales and Hales. What I'm saying is the agency will have a really clear power to... to um, oh. Sorry. <laughs> will have a really clear power to um, drive forward the economy of the south of Scotland, supporting communities and um, businesses across the south of Scotland. I'm not going to cut you off, but I am going to say that the Cabinet Secretary will be in, and I'm sure he will look forward to your robust line of questioning. Yeah, it's a point that we have to, you know, Colin yeah, Smith started absolutely. it off, and it's, uh, it's not been answered. A absolutely, and, and I'm sure he's listening in and, and taking cognizance that you're going to ask him the question. The next question is from G the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Gail. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. It's just to follow... Um, uh, Richard's other line of questioning about duplication of services um, and the bill specifies a role for encouraging business startups and entrepreneurship. Is that to replace Business Gateway or is that to work alongside Business Gateway and how will they work with local authorities to encourage uh, new businesses but also the growth of existing ones? Karen. Um, in advance of the um, new agency, we've created the South of Scotland Economic Partnership that brings together the seven key public sector agencies supporting economic development in the South of Scotland. Both councils, as um, Mr Smith has already suggested, are members of that um, uh, partnership. That's helping develop the alignment across agencies. Um, and we're absolutely having those discussions about what makes sense for the business in terms of who delivers what. How do you make sure that there's one clear place for businesses to go, get the services they need, but they mightn't be delivered by the agency, they might be delivered through other organisations or um, local authorities or the private sector or the third sector. So you could see a role for the agency in terms of that alignment and helping business navigate what they sometimes think of as quite a complicated landscape. So will Business Gateway still exist? That's a decision that hasn't been made. Okay. Um, it, we're talking with local authorities about how those services are best delivered. Um, it, absolutely, Business Gateway might be the best way to do it. That, those discussions are still evolving. Okay. That's fine. Okay, thank you. The next question is Peter. Thanks, convener. Um, we've kind of strayed into a fair bit of my question, but nevertheless, I'll, 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 I'll pose it anyway. Uh, I mean, basically, how will the new agency work with Scottish Enterprise and HIE given that SE will continue to have a presence in the area and that HIE is the model organisation for the, the new agency in the south of Scotland? Um, so, so, yes, I think, it is, I think we have covered quite a lot of that ground, um, but it's about that alignment and complementarity and finding a way for the agency to um, bring together what businesses and communities need. Mm. I mean, um, specifically, the Scottish Enterprise... Obviously, its role will diminish in the future once the new agency is up and running. But it will still have a, it will still have a role in that in that same region. Is that is that correct? Am I correct in that assumption? Absolutely. Um, Scottish Enterprise will still operate as the National Economic Development Agency across Scotland. So, as Sandra was mentioning, there are various national products that SE deliver. So, the um, Regional Selective Assistance Grants, the Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service, some of the Skills Development International Services, they're all delivered nationally, and you'd expect Scottish Enterprise to do that um, post the creation of the new agency. There's also expertise in Scottish Enterprise that you wouldn't want to cut the south of Scotland off from. So um, energy being a good example of that. Scottish Enterprise have really um, a depth of information around energy. So you wouldn't want to cut the south off from that, from benefiting from that um, expertise in a national body. Similarly, you can see the new agency developing areas of expertise reflecting its own economy. So forestry, for example, how would that then help um, other agencies like Scottish Enterprise and High, so that kind of alignment and complementarity all the way through the system. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I can understand that. Um, and both Scottish Enterprise and HIE publish annual business plans, which include useful budget information, organisational targets, and priorities. Is there anything in the bill that requires this, this new South of Scotland agency to do likewise? Sandra. Yeah. Um, well, well the, the, the most direct compar comparison within the bill would be the, um, the requirement for the, the new body to produce an action plan for agreement uh, with ministers, and that, that action plan would set out how it was likely to, how it would be looking to achieve its aims. Um, and that, 
that um, I suppose in, in the way as you mentioned, the sort of business plan and corporate plans could, will be used as a sort of their blueprint for how they're going to take forward their activities going forward. And obviously, obviously, the new board will have a, a, a big input in, into that uh, that planning process as well. I would I would assume. Yes, we would expect that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, John, yours is the next question. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, yes, looking at the financial memorandum um, and uh, some of the figures, and I mean, a lot of that makes sense. The, the three parts you've got about um, setup costs, running costs, and then the ongoing budget. On the s setting up costs on page four, I was particularly struck by the estates figure. Um, because you've got, and I agree with this process of taking a low figure and a high figure, but they do seem quite extreme that the low figure could be £542,000, the high figure could be £2.6 million. So could you maybe just explain why there's such a gap in there? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So um, in bringing those estimates together, we were looking at all sorts of different possibilities in terms of what the estates and the geographic footprint of the new agency might look like. Um, at the higher end, we've got costs in assuming that you'd need to fit out a building um, from scratch, basically, um, and at the lower end, it's much more about co-location. It was very clear from the consultation that people wanted to see accessible everywhere, um, and we're exploring that co-location and how you deliver it, both co-locating with other bits of the public sector estate, but also bits of um, private sector um, or third sector agencies which offer uh, office accommodation. So that, that, kind of, that just explains the range. Um, so it's much more expensive, obviously, to fit out a new building. It's less expensive to share premises with others. We're hoping that that co-location point will be much, will be the kind of way that the agency operates. Right, and, and so that includes all the possibilities. I mean, wh whether it's one main headquarters and a, sm a, a lot smaller offices, or two big headquarters, or whatever the option might be. It, it, it explores all the, those, it gives us the financial estimates for all sorts of different um, models within that. So um, one, of the, uh, one of the options consulted on was around that hub and spoke model. So having two or three key hubs for the agency and then um, spreading out across the agency. So yes, that, those estimates cover those, that range, those range of options. Okay, thank you. And the other point was um, under the part three total budget allocation, Ian, and I think it says this elsewhere, but it says it in page 10, paragraph 53, it says it intended that the allocation given to the new body will be equivalent on a per capita basis to the allocation for HIE. Now, I mean, I accept that it needs to be higher than what Scottish Enterprise gets because we are a more urban area. But it, it strikes me that HIE is much more spread out, has a whole lot of islands, it has much more challenges than the south of Scotland does. So can you explain why it would be a matching per capita amount? <laughs> Who'd like to go with that? I'm sorry, I'm trying to control the committee here because there's a few Highlands and Islands MSPs who, who might want to jump in on the back of that. So Karen, um, would you like to go on that? Um, Yes, so um, we've we looked towards the Highlands and Islands and saw very similar challenges um, around that geographic spread, um, around the rurality issues, around those sorts of challenges. Um, we listened carefully to what consultees were saying, so they made the, um, the case really strongly that that new body needed to be um, funded in a way that was equivalent to Highlands and Islands Enterprise. I'm sure this is an issue you'll want to pick up with the Cabinet Secretary about how you um, justify different um, funding amounts. Um, I can explain where we've got to in the financial memorandum, but I suspect the bigger point is... There's a similarity with rurality, but there's no islands that I'm aware of. So, I mean, Im immediately that's a, co a cost. I mean, I will take this up with the Cabinet Secretary, so I'm not going to press you on this too far. But, you know... I mean, surely the needs are not as great as the Highlands and Islands. Or do you not want to answer that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, John. You I'll seem to be sit. taking some committee members with you and some committees against okay, you. So let let, 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 <laughs> let's keep that one for the Cabinet Secretary. Colin, you wanted to come in, and then I've got Maureen wants to come I'll in. I'll come in as one of the members. She certainly is not taken with him. And say <laughs> no, that I Colin, very much, we uh, said we very much welcome the financial memorandum. 
um, commitment, um, given that the region is the lowest paid in, in Scotland. But specifically on, on, on that commitment um, per capita, um, it, it, that would be £42 million pounds a year, would be the budget based on the current uh, budget of Highlands and Islands Enterprise. But what you're actually proposing in the financial memorandum is actually only £32 million pounds in the first year, and it gradually rises until we get to that £42 million. Pounds. So, in fact, it's not per capita in the first two years. Why, why is that the case? Because I can think of many projects that would spend that per capita funding um, very quickly in the south of Scotland. Um, so why, why are we not getting that per capita funding until effectively year three? Karen. We've been working on that transition planning. So on, um, our assumption is that you build up to the full allocation. So in the first year, you won't have your full staff in place. You won't have your full capital program in place. You want to take the board, uh, take the members of the um, agency and be plotting out that capital program and where those resources can be used most effectively. Um, we took the view that you'd, you'd need two or three years to get to that point. But obviously, that's a... a Point that you'll want to discuss more broadly. Thank you, Colin. Uh, Maureen, you've got a question. It's not related to the financial memorandum, but thank you, convener. When this bill was drafted, um, we were in a different political situation than we are now, and we now have a situation where we could probably have a border down the middle of, of the Irish Sea and Galloway and um, that area of Dries and Galloway will become a kind of borderland. So, in a different sense, is there anything that should be in this bill now to strengthen the area and strengthen the powers in relation to various things that you hadn't foreseen back then? And, you know, has this been considered? Sandra, do you want to, to go on that? Or? Yeah, I think I'm... Um the point I would make on that, as we say, the, the bill has been um, drafted on a, an approach to make it high level and enabling, and enable the new agency to be flexible um, in its approach and responsive. So that means that, as we say, it, it, it has the ability to, to, to change what it does. So therefore, as circumstances change over time, it will be able to adapt and respond to that. And we think that flexibility is, is, is what is needed to be able to, as you say, um, reflect future situations because we can't we can't really future proof everything but that that way we can ensure the agency can can respond okay. thank you i've got two more questions uh rich Lau followed by john scott yeah. what if uh, Karen jackson said um would you agree with me uh, and i used to be out in the road a lot and the, and the jobs i'd done i, I wasn't based in office but um basically the south of scotland is wide varied so the new board will need time to work up a, where they, they want to be as a, a main hub or hubs and also where they, they want staff to be. Is that correct? Uh, Who'd like to go with that? I, I will go. Um, I think the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's but, what the answer but, would be. Um, some decisions will need to be play, made before um, the full before the board. So the point the column just, was making, just making you know, that you're, balance. Sorry. So, you, you, not all, so some decisions will need to be made yeah. just for purely practical reasons. So yeah. I, 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 I suspect I should qualify my yes, but... Yeah, so you're, you're not, sorry, Katina, uh, you're not um, you know, going to say that the headquarters is going to be at X and, and the hubs are going to be at Y. You're going to, you're going to say that the board will come in and they will then decide uh, in consultation with the people for the benefit of South of Scotland. Um, I suspect some of those decisions will, be, uh, will need to have been taken before the 1st of April 2020, so it won't be completely for the members of the agency. Um, you'll need some hubs in place so that there will be somewhere for people to start operating from for the, from the 1st of April. There will be flexibility to change, but we, we will expect some hubs and some decisions to need to have been made. To clarify, thanks. John. To go back um, to your the Ayrshire question, and just to get clarification in my own mind, I think you did say, but um, and why it's not part of this region. Did you say that the Ayrshire local authorities did not want to be part of the South of Scotland enterprise uh, air re region? And also, is, is this in part being driven by the, the growth deals, the Borderland growth deal and, and the, the Ayrshire growth deal? Is it in part being driven by these two separate future funding streams, potential? So, 
Um, the Ayrshire, three local authorities have self-identified as that um, growth deal area for the Ayrshires. So they, they focused on that structure rather than looking to the south. Absolutely, we recognise there are real economic links across the council boundaries. Um, the, eco the economics don't always respect council boundaries. Um, so it, it was driven by the Ayrshires themselves, so they were, they were absolutely focused on getting their own growth deal and looking at their own structures across those three Ayrshire councils. Certainly in the responses that they gave to us in terms of the consultation, they were looking towards that structure rather than towards the south of Scotland, but did make the point that, that establishing an effective working relationship was key. Okay, thanks very much. Colin, you get a final quite short right. question. Just briefly, the... Why, why there's no explicit reference to equalities within the, the, the South of Scotland Bill. Obviously, the, the legislation on, on high talks about provisions um, on responsibility with regards to improving opportunities for disabled people, women, ethnic minorities, and, and enforcing existing legislation. I note that legislation also means that, that high and Scottish enterprise are required to give preference within reason to disabled ex-servicemen and women when selecting disabled people for, for training, but there's no explicit reference to equalities within the, the South of Scotland Bill. So I just wondered the, the reasons for that. Felicity. Um, the, there is no express reference on the face of the bill, but there is an intention to uh, amend the relevant uh, statutory instruments that apply the public sector equality duty and the other sort of suite of equalities legislations to this new body. Um, that will be done um, as part of the preparation for the commencement of the body in 1st April. So they hopefully will be in place by 1st April 2020, and if they're not, they'll be in place very shortly after that, with the body operating as if it were affected by those duties anyway. Okay, thank you. I think that's uh, all, all the uh, questions. I'm going to ask, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you as, as a panel for giving evidence. Karen, you, you, I think, answered the majority of the questions, and, and thank you for, for that. The, the, I'm going to ask you just to stay where you are so we can just deal with the next item on the agenda, which is agenda item three, which is subordinate legislation. It's a negative instrument for bovine TV. Just before I do it, I'd like to ask members to declare any interest. I am going to declare an interest in that I am a member of a farming partnership. Does anyone else wish to declare an interest? Peter? Yeah, I would likewise uh, declare an interest as a member of a farming partnership as well. John? John Scott, I'd like to declare an interest as a member of a farming partnership too. Okay, item three, therefore, is the consideration of one negative instrument relating to TB control measures and compensation for bovine animals. The committee has previously considered an earlier version of this instrument on the 20th of June, but that was revoked on the 30th June when we identified there had been difficulties with the consultation process. I wrote to the, cabinet, uh, to the Scottish Government on this SI to clarify the compensation arrangements to... Uh, bovine TB and the responses can be found in the committee papers to confirm that the compensation will be different for bovine TB and BSE. Uh, as far as the committee should be aware that no motions to annul have been received in relation to this instrument. Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation to this instrument? Okay, that is agreed. I'm now going to suspend the meeting for five minutes um, to allow the witnesses to depart and the new witness panel to come in. So the meeting is suspended for five minutes.
We're now going to move on to item four, which is subordinate legislation in the form of an affirmative instrument on agricultural holdings. Could I just ask if anyone, before we do, wants to declare an interest? I'm going to declare an interest that I'm a member of a farming partnership. Likewise, I will declare an interest as a member of a farming partnership as well. As a landowner and a farmer. Okay, so we're going to move on to agenda item four, and this is consideration of one affirmative instrument, uh, the Agricultural Holdings Scotland Act 1991, variation of Schedule 5, Order 2019 draft. The committee will take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for the rural economy. The motion seeking the approval of the affirmative instrument will be considered at item 5. Uh, members should note there have been no representations to the committee on this instrument. I'd like to welcome from the Scottish Government, Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy, Jen Willoughby, the Head of Agricultural Holdings Team, and Julia bergen Pearson, the Scottish Government Legal Director. Cabinet Secretary, I think you'd like to make a brief opening statement of up to three minutes. Uh, yes, good morning, Convener, and thank you for inviting me to discuss said order. Um, I hope that you will agree with me that this order is a good news story for tenant farmers in Scotland. Schedule 5 of the Ag Holding Scotland Act 91 sets out a list of improvements to agricultural holdings which may be eligible for compensation when the tenant leaves the holding. The list was originally created for the Agriculture Scotland Act 1948, uh, which is uh, some time ago. It hasn't been updated since. Some items which are readily accepted now as being legitimate improvements are therefore not listed therein. Informal arrangements may be in place between landlords and tenants to cover some of these items, but this will depend on individual arrangements, meaning there is no uniformity of practice. During the widespread consultation conducted by the Ag Holdings Legislation Review Group in 2014, there were, were calls from the sector for the list to be updated. The purpose was to reflect modern farming practice and to eliminate doubt and confusion. The underlying rationale of current provisions for WAGO is to encourage tenant farmers to invest in the agricultural holding and keep it in good condition, knowing that they will be adequately compensated. Updating the schedule, therefore, benefits both the tenant who makes an investment and the landlord whose property is thereby improved. Uh, in order to ensure that any update was industry-led, we placed a duty on the Tenant Farming Commissioner to make recommendations to modernise the list. He consulted with key stakeholders and delivered his recommendations to me in December last year, and we're now seeking to implement those recommendations. This means that for improvements begun once this order comes into force in January next year, the updated schedule would apply. I hope this will lead to greater certainty for both sides, and I have been heartened by the positive press reaction since the order was laid. In conclusion, Convener, I, I hope that you and your colleagues, members of the committee, will approve this order, and I and my officials are happy to seek to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And the first question will be from Peter Chapman. Peter. Thanks, and good, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, you, you said it's a good news story, and I certainly agree. It is a good news, news story for tenants, and it's, it's very welcome. Um, you also said you had made widespread consultation with the industry, uh, which I also accept. Were there any particular areas of concern that, that, that were highlighted during that uh, consultation process? Um, well, we, we did consult fairly widely with um, the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association, the NFUS, Scottish Land and Estates, the Charter Surveyors and uh, SAVA, Auctioners and, uh, Auctioneers and Valuation Association. Um, I think, broadly speaking, the, it's reasonable to say, uh, in as much as it's ever accurate to make such generalisations, that the majority of stakeholders are broadly satisfied by the outcome and indeed have, uh, in many cases, welcomed it. Um, but of course, uh, in the way of things, not everybody get, gets everything that they want. I suppose you could say that about Christmas as, as well, perhaps. Uh, a, you know, government's not really well cast in the role of, of, of Santa, however desirable that may be. So, yes, some stakeholders may be disappointed we haven't been able to take on board. For example, the Tenant, Farmer Commission, the Tenant Farming Commissioner's recommendation to include 
permissions, consents, contracts, authorizations, or restrictions. And I, I, I know uh, why, and I can explain why we, we were not able to accept that and perhaps can come on to set that out later. Other than that, I'm not aware if there's any specific areas of, of disappointment. Uh, Thank you very much for that. I mean, uh, the, the, the only detailed thing that I would follow up on is a, a catch-all clause seems not to have been included. Why have you chosen not to include a catch-all clause? Um, well, the, the Commissioner considered the option of a general catch-all to future-proof the schedule. And I, I know that uh, Mr Chapman is correct, convener, that some of the stakeholders were in favour of this approach. And I can see the attraction of it, but I think the, the reason that we elected not to include the catch-all clause is that this kind of general clause is open to interpretation. Um, it may therefore lead to more disputes and disagreements about what is in scope and what is not. The purpose of what we're doing is to provide as much specific detail, specification as is possible in order to inform the parties in the negotiations over the compensation at Wago and to have the limit as, as little amb scope for ambiguity and therefore disagreement and disputation as was possible. Um, I do agree, however, with the recommendation of the Farming Commissioner, Tenant Farming Commissioner, that instead of a catch-all, that we do commit to reviewing the schedule on a regular basis. And I'm willing to make this commitment to look at the schedule, say, every five years to see if it is still fit for purpose. Uh, and indeed, I mean, if a more frequent review were, were, were shown to be necessary, then of course, that's something that I would always uh, consider very carefully indeed. So in short, rather than a catch-all, which we felt may give rise to possible difficulties, we thought that uh, a willingness to update the list more frequently than has been in the past might be the better preferred approach. I would, I would just, I would just say, I, I think that is important. It is important that we look at it on a regular basis, and, and I, I certainly welcome that the, that the promise to, to do exactly that. So, yes. Thank you, Peter. Uh, John, you've got a brief follow-up, and then Richard. Very brief follow-up, and declare an interest again as a farmer. But um, my, I'm just seeking a final assurance uh, in terms of ECHR compliance. Um, our explanatory notes um, say this will avoid any unfairness. Uh, which I know was a, a, an issue before um, in, in, in various parts of this legislation and, and, and we've been rebuked in the past by Lord Gill and others for our inadequacies here in Parliament. So I just, a final reassurance from you, Cabinet Secretary, that this is a ECHR compliant piece of legislation. We, we have no reason to believe that there is any um, a significant risk attaching to any claim under ECHR. Uh, which I presume would be based on Article 1 of the first protocol, as most of these issues uh, are. So um, we have no reason to believe that there's any issue involved, but I entirely agree with the approach that Mr Scott has advocated, namely that we have to take great care in um, this area of legislation, not least because, sadly, there has been uh, an instance where previous uh, legislation passed by a former administration had to be overturned and corrected by us as it happened, um, with with uh, consequences which I, I know we all very much regret. Um, so a, uh, I'm not aware of any issue. And as far as I'm aware, I'm advised that the SLE did not raise any issue in relation to this particular matter. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Richard. Yeah. Cabinet Secretary, I think this is a, a really good news story and I compliment you and your officials on the work that you've done on this. Um, the questions I have in this report, the Tenant Farmer Commissioner uh, said there is reasonable certainty that Schedule 5 can be reviewed regularly. I think you partly answered my question, but how often will you review the schedule so that emerging issues can be included, please? Um, well, I've mentioned a period of, of five years, but that's kind of a long stop. I mean, you know, if, uh, if uh, all parties come to me and suggest there's some pressing need for a more um, swift review, then I would always seek to be as accommodating as is possible, assuming that the issue could be dealt with by secondary legislation. Primary legislation, of course, is, is another kettle of fish. 
particularly in these times. And I won't mention the B word because I don't want to depress anybody this morning. I've always found you very accommodating, Cabinet Secretary. So basically, uh, in the, any problems that I've had. The, also, the Tenant Farming Commissioner said in his report there may be a cause for drawing attention to the fact that improvements that are part of a d diversification are subject to different regulation with respect to approval and compensation arrangements. Such a note uh, appears not to be included. Why not? And do you have other plans to avoid possible confusion in this area? Well, I think that this, this matter is a sort of lawyerly answer, uh, which is that the Act only permits us to vary the provisions of the schedule. So clarification of the point that is raised by the TFC, the Commissioner, is a, a matter for guidance. But my officials will work with the Commissioner to produce a code of practice to clarify any of these issues. So hopefully it can be dealt with in that fashion, you know, rather than by um, this statutory instrument which we're considering this morning. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, that, that appears to be all the questions that the committee wished to ask you on this. Do you want to make any brief closing remarks? Uh, no. Thank you. We'll therefore move on to agenda item five, uh, which is, and this is the formal consideration of motion S5M14752 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, asking the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee to recommend that the Agricultural Holdings Scotland Act 1991 variation of Schedule 5 Order 2019 draft be approved. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, would you like to move motion S5M14752? Moved. Do you have any further comments that you wish to make? None. Are there any comments that the members wish to make? The question, therefore, is that motion S5M14752 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, and thank you for you and your witnesses to give evidence to the committee this morning. I would ask if you'd like to depart quietly while we move on to agenda item six, which is a public petition. This is the consideration of... Uh, PE 1616, which seeks the Parliament's support to make it an offence to park in front of a dropped curb. This is the committee's first consideration of this petition. The committee, however, as we all know, has discussed this in other evidence session on the Transport Bill. Does anyone wish to make comments on this? Uh, Maureen. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, as you've said, um, I have tended to as far as possible, ask the witnesses uh, during the pr our progress on the transport bill about this particular issue. We, in the bill, there's obviously um, proposals relating to uh, pavement parking and double parking, um, but not about parking in front of dropped curbs. And you know, as I've said, I've had a constituent um, who has a real issue uh, about this. So. Um, I think there is an opportunity to get movement on this in the Transport Bill. Um, and I think that we should um, congratulate Mr Shaw, I think it is, on uh, bringing forward his petition. And I think there is an opportunity for us to progress um, what he wants to do in the Transport Bill. So um, rather than just say that's it, I think we should keep it open our options open and his options open um, and see how we can uh, hopefully try and incorporate this into the Transport Bill. Okay, thank you, Maureen. Uh, Richard and then John. Yeah, uh, Kavina, can I agree with my colleague Maureen Watt? Uh, most certainly, you know, uh, people who are in wheelchairs face a daily problem trying to cross the road and we forget that, you know, we have the height, they're sitting in a, a wheelchair so that they're lower down, they have to cope with traffic, they have to cope with all the things that uh, everyday life and I think that we should certainly uh, keep this open and recognise there is a problem that has to be resolved and hopefully will be resolved through the Transport Bill. Thank you Richard. John. Thank you Convener. I just agree with what uh, Maureen Watt and Richard Lyle have said and, and it's certainly been an issue that's been brought to my attention in my constituency the unreasonable parking on pavements, denying uh, wheelchair access to those pavements. The problem is there's also times when it's reasonable to park on pavements, given the narrowness of streets in some residential areas, and quite how that is resolved. 
I would like to hear evidence taken on that were I to be part of the committee that's considering the transport bill, which I am not. But uh, I hope that perhaps the, that, that committee will look very closely at these issues which are all related and, and which do need to be addressed because there's certainly a, a significant degree of unhappiness among the disabled community about the lack of access, reasonable access to pavements. Okay, it, there seems to be a general consensus, as there has been on uh, previous evidence sessions in the Transport Bill, that the issue of drop curbs is a matter that the committee should continue to raise and try and get uh, the government to consider as part of the Transport Bill uh, 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 and try and maybe get some amendments to, to get in there, to get into the bill uh, to cover this issue. But it also seems that there seems to be general consensus that as part of this process, it'd be useful to keep the petition open. Um, therefore, it would assist us in uh, taking that matter forward with the government. Are we in agreement with, with that statement as a committee? Yes. Okay, so I think that's what we'll do, is we'll keep the petition open as we've agreed. And thank you very much. I'm now going to uh, close the meeting and move into a private session. Thank you very much. <laughs>